Hello everyone, today we talk about crossbows in 10th and 11th century France, right? This is a very interesting topic because today I wanted actually to talk about this, this type of unit like French crossbow in this period, but it sounded too wargamistic and naturally the most interesting part though, in which we will focus on is, is the crossbow, right? And why is it important to talk about it in this specific time in history? Well, because Exactly in the 10th century, we have the first uh, witness of a crossbow. Let's say back again, even though we will, you know, criticize this um, this statement in Europe, in in West in Western Europe, actually in the 10th century, right? We have the first account that is actually uh, Richard de Rennes, uh, History of France of crossbows employed uh, on two occasions that are fundamentally the uh, siege of uh, Saint-Lys in 941 and at Verdun in 985. And so we have this evidence of Sagittari cum arcubus et balistis, hmm, which means in Latin archers, right, from Sagitta which means arrow. Uh, cum arcubus, which means with bows, right, and at uh, ballistis, that is, in fact, the crossbow, right. You know that there is, um, uh, when we talk about medieval sources, and we stress this a lot of times, we, we shouldn't be looking for an actual um, categorization, classification of weapons on the base of the terminology used, because there was no... Uh, the language didn't hadn't reached that level of scientific precision, right? It wasn't not needed, right? And uh, in this context, though, uh, the term ballista, rather than meaning this kind of artillery that existed since ancient times, etc., it, it referred to the uh, the typology of the mechanism and the fact that there were sagittari with bows and this ballistas uh, uh, evidently means that you know it's not that these guys were bringing on their shoulder uh, an artillery piece, but uh, what we could call a crossbow, but also in here, what's a crossbow, right? Because um, there were, let's say, small ballistas that could be kind of crossbow-like, you know, and in, in it's, um, it's it technically the same concept, it's just the engine, this fact that there's a string that is pulled and then trigger, and then you can uh, release this uh, force elastic uh, of elastic tension and and shooting the projectile very, very fast and very uh, also very precisely uh, at a short range because it's kind of a less of a flatter parabola at shorter range kind of blank and the 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 concept here is however that we talk as if there had been an absence in western warfare of of the crossbow right uh, what is usually not known and at least not discussed extensively is that objectively in the ancient world crossbows were were out there right they weren't very common apparently and seemingly and the problem also is that we don't know much about them um, we know the Greeks used them we know the Romans especially in late Roman times used them and here we could explain why in this period, especially in Hellenistic times, in late antique times, uh, this was used, and it's it's kind of complicated in the sense of the, the uh, Hellenistic city states. We we know that these were um, centers in which mm, there were a lot of inventions actually, but actually not many of them were put into use. This was mostly the deal, especially of Hellenic scientific mindset. You know, the Greeks loved science, but but mostly from a theoretical point of view. Some of the greatest inventions at the time um, not only were not applicated, but objectively also they, they might have not never found uh, an actual application. I think it's extremely naive to, to presume that, I don't know, since Heron had invented um, a steam engine, you know, the, the ancient world could have used it, you know, the terrible Romans arrived and destroyed the cities, and uh, it's not how it worked. Um, it's not even just about slavery or mindsets, it's just that there was not the uh, technological potential, the, the, the amount of resources to invest uh, effectively in this machinery and to make it use at one point. Um, and and there the was stuff that was cheaper and more effective, and therefore there was no need 
right? It's not a matter of mindset. There is a strong economical logic behind certain things. In late Roman times, now we know the, the Romans, of course, basically adopted uh, in terms of artillery the same technology of the Greeks, right? They were acquainted with, firstly, with, you know, in Sicily, we think, during the First Punic War, especially campaigning against this um, soundly urbanized region. Um, they needed, more than else, um, even the local, um, you know, craftsmen and people who were expert in handling these weapons for, for siege warfare, essentially, because that's what the ancient world basically relegated the, the it, this ballistas too, um, and there was no other way of, of doing that. Like we see in open field, you we never find the gastrafetus out of siege warfare context, right? It, even if probably did happen, right? But the gastrafetus takes its name from, from ancient Greek essentially because this stuff was pointed one one part of on the ground and another on under your stomach. The, the gastrus, then that's the, the thing, and then it was pulled, right? Not very differently, in fact, from what this. 10th century crossbows. We made; they were actually made. Uh, they were made like right, um, and uh, the the Romans had eventually put their hands on lots, lots of torsion catapults. However, mostly during their Carthaginian campaigns, uh, one in Spain when uh, Carthago Nova was was captured, they found lots of, of engines there, and later on uh, during the Third Punic War when they captured. Carthage itself. When they, found, they found these Punic war houses with like literally thousands of, of machinery like that. From there on, Rome is fully in line in terms of use of um, ancient artillery, right? And there are changes that start occurring in late Roman times um, for several reasons. Fundamentally, ancient the ancient world had. Um, you know, had a, a huge, especially Greeks and Romans, had this, this huge emphasis uh, put on the great decisive battle, right? This armies of tens of thousands of men, etc. That's quite ideal in part, and probably we have to acknowledge that um, probably ancient warfare was much more similar to medieval one, uh, also in terms of this widespread of, um, of, of siege warfare that maybe was not recorded in, in every single detail for certain mm, stylistical reasons. But let's say that towards late Roman times, this is a very slow, gradual change, you know, mm, states run out of resources. Like I say, the Roman army has problems of record meant uh, the cities decline. So uh, we can't say that there is less siege warfare because paradoxically, you know, these massive uh, classical infrastructures that cities were actually remained uh, there and they became in fact more imposing even for early medieval standards um, but um, at the same time you needed kind of different um, different engines and uh, also simpler ones and in fact late Roman times see this readaptation this, this reshaping uh, on different models for example the Onager that I've never honestly found out when it was firstly built, like I presume that this stuff was around even before then we actually imagined, because technically even in the Bible you find, uh, even though this, uh, certain parts were written later, but let's say, I don't know, in the 6th century, uh, even before the Macedons that, and, and the, the Syracusans that were the ones that actually invented siege engines to work things like machine, siege machineries, and we don't know what they were, also because, as we were saying before, the, the terminology is not very specific. But, let's say, you know, the, the, the Romans themselves kind of abandoned, in part, torsion, sophisticated torsion catapults. They also costed a lot. It, it, it required a lot of... Uh, they were extremely delicate things. Um, we, should, we should make uh, more videos about ancient siege warfare, because there are a few things that... Uh, are important to to understand that that they're not often only gotten about it, um, and the and even using you know reverting to muscular force, thinking about the petraria that would remain fundamental in the early Middle Ages, um, the the standard for for around in Europe, for you and and not just in Europe, like also in the Near East and beyond. There is just a lot of guys pulling rope that that is uh, hinged at uh, at a at an arm that is, of course, is pulled in the tropes from the other side, the projectile, and that that how uh, it was, and it was effective, right? It's also the ancestor of trebuchet. It's, it's ironic we we made a couple of days ago a video about uh, actually the 
the twilight of trebuchet warfare, so we are at the opposite ends of that. But it's essentially the same technology, right, that eventually just evolved. And we can talk about this about crossbows, too. And there were other transformations, though, that in moments of crisis, like late Roman times, in, in part objectively were, um, required a kind of greater sophistications. For example, it was the so-called solenarian that some people think it was like a crossbow. It was probably just an, a bow with a guide that increased a bit of precision. So because, why? Because maybe just projectiles were running out or were most, more costly, right? Or stuff like that. But especially we do find things like the, the manu ballista, which, which, which in Latin means literally the hand ballistas. Because conceptually, this stuff was, was always there. Actually, even during the Middle Ages, there were things like ballistas meant as the same stuff that you could find in, in ancient times, like with uh, with torsion, engine, etc. That were in use actually up to very late in time, even in the 16th century before uh, siege, um, you know, siege warfare and, you know, warfare in general would be come to be dominated by gunpowder, uh, firearms, uh, and so on. And these manubalistas actually were, were quite widespread, as, as far as we can understand. Uh, by widespread, we, we mean, I mean personally, like extensively, in the sense that, of course, they weren't probably prevalent weapons. The, the, the average missile weapon was um, was archer, uh, like uh, archery, um, and, and slings uh, as well, so in part. And, and other stuff like javelins and naturally the, the plumbata slash Mazio Barboli, for example. Uh, but this stuff w was widespread in the sense that you can't start finding it basically everywhere the empire had been, and even beyond. That is, when the, the empire evaporates, especially in certain areas of, of the West, um, you find this stuff still in employment, meaning not the actual pieces that had belonged to, to, to the Romans, because this stuff, the pair perished, you know, they were made of organic material, but uh, because the work kept being built, right, so the concept of crossbow, um, so this very simple mechanism, if you think about it, it doesn't even take much of a, you know, um, survived, and we have evidence throughout the early Middle Ages of the survival of crossbows in areas that are even not particularly, you know, in advanced from, from, you know, in terms of technological point of view, you know, we have evidence from from stones in in Pictish Scotland during the the, uh, the seventh ninth century of crossbows that were used and many people think ah oh, you know in early medieval times just the word crossbows but the were the words kind of small well actually no this is this seemingly is not even true right I I, un I don't understand personally very much about um, this. Um, let's say, the, the most technological side and especially typization of these weapons. And as far as I know, the um, the research avant-garde are um, concerned, especially in trying to redefine the, uh, the terminology that we have to to um, to, to describe this, this bow, because objectively they were kind of different, and of course the major differentiation would occur in kind of lower medieval times, but uh, even at this time there were kind of substantial differences. The, the problem is that we don't have a great deal of evidence out there, right? We know that, I don't know, in, in uh, the darkest ages, no, the dark ages didn't exist just for you to know, but what, what they should be supposed, like the moment of 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 greatest, you know, uh, technological stagnation at least, and um, at the bottom that just would eventually rise well, again. We find in Scotland crossbows, right? So you can't see from that 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 basically crossbows were present all over Europe. Of course, we can imagine more in Mediterranean areas, right? But the fact that there is no attention toward t attention towards that is, I don't think it's indicative of the fact that they were kind of rare or that um, I mean I'm more um, I'm more inclined to believe that there were there were other weapons that were preferred like the bow for example appears prominently much more in sources in iconography right uh, the, it, it it was much um, much more effective if you know how if you knew how to to use it at one point and many people did know how to because in early medieval times especially many peasants kind of 
went back to be uh, you know to to live in in, in uh, you know here is a history of distribution in terms of property but you know the the, the roman latifundium collapses so the the, the colonist transforms once itself a kind of a free peasant ideally um even if in some places never uh, didn't properly happen like that and they started hunting and using bow regularly right and it takes a, a long time to train a person to you know how to use a bow right you can teach you know th that's the effectiveness of the crossbow like you you can train a person like in uh you know you, for two two months so using a crossbow and turn in in a very good crossbowman um well, with a bowman, it's much more complicated. You know, you in two months, you you still keep kind of cutting your your cheek when when you you relieved the arrow. So it's it's complicated, but there are advantages and disadvantages. Excuse me, I drink a little bit before we go on. And regarding to this, you know, advantages and disadvantages. What another advice, I I feel myself to tell you is that n never think at the way technology developed especially in terms of this you know why did the crossbow develop at a certain point where certain weapons were used and just thinking about the mechanics of the weapon right we when we talk about technology we don't talk about a technology that is valid for every single time in every single place um, and it's mostly about a cost benefit ratio like it's obvious that a crossbow is powerful but you need a society that kind of can even politically or socially make use of this weapon, right? For example, in early medieval times, slings seem to disappear, uh, right? No, not literally, but I mean the the, the the slings were a prominent weapon. Um, in ancient times, we we usually say that with the progressive romanization and um, professionalization of of our early ethnic auxiliaries into uh, drilled Roman, standardly drilled Roman soldiers. Uh, certain communities lost their traditional aptness to sl slink using, like I don't know the Balearic Islands or or, or roads, these places like for which they were famous. And objectively, in early medieval times, we we seem to see like where did these links go? Yeah, there is a, a great prominence of of bow use, but not much of slings. And it's kind of complicated to explain. Probably this link was, um, you know, th there was a need of, um, you know, disarming the populations. Like, uh, early and high medieval times are the moment in which, um, you know, th there is a progressive loss of freedom of the individual freemen, in fact, in that would turn into kind of a serf under a lord and whatever. But early medieval times are also the exact moment in which this um, you know, centralization of political power is as it, at its loosest, right? So it still does not really explain what was going on out there, why we have such a few evidence, but it could be a different tension and taste from the sources. Like at this time, just Christians, um, uh, Christian priests v wrote, basically. So it's not that the Christian priest was much concerned about sling using, right? Even though they, they eventually wrote, came to write about a lot of military details but still not in a way that would give like a you know perfect picture and we actually know that slings were used right and they probably were used even a very long time sometimes in, in the 14th century here uh, w w the, the stuff I'm researching on I you know it's all about crossbows like s crossbows are the standard like the 14th century yeah uh, I know that every English follower of mine will think about the longbow properly um, in this time but uh, actually, uh, all the rest of Europe was standardly about crossbows. Just if you you have to go a bit into Eastern Europe or the Balkan uh, the Balkans to find uh, bows used in the, you know even composite bows and stuff like that. But Western Europe is standardly cr about crossbows, and yet you do find I did find a couple of snip, you know slings being used and even being named like uh, like a, not a big deal, much of an exception, right? So, and we're talking about a time which uh, even you know, armor and then uh, had evolved dramatically. Um, in um, here, even firearms were spreading, and uh, compared to the ancient world. So, um, with the crossbow, uh, the question is why did this apparently fell uh, fall of use? And the easy answer is uh, we don't know. <laughs> you know. There are certain things that actually nobody can answer, but we can make hypotheses. 
some goods are bad, some bad. I personally believe it was mostly a matter of uh, that this stuff was not preserved uh, archaeologically very easily, even though we do find stuff, even bows are preserved at times. Um, and longbows, by the way, because longbow, longbows existed since prehistory and, of course, were used all over Europe, like even in the early medieval times. Um, and um, and also, there is probably, uh, you know, another system you can consider it like, you know, who, who would use it? Like, early medieval times, objectively, were a moment in which, okay, there were a lot of free communities, but many of them were very poor. Right. If you look at the hair bands, that is these major levies of peasants, etc., uh, in places like Central Europe, etc., you you realize that the peasantry, yeah, they were kind of warlike in part, but they seemingly didn't have much of a cohesion or or effect in the at the end of the day. Professionalization, especially from the eighth century, starts. Uh, increasing a lot, and with that, and with that, it intensifies the loss of free, um, let's say, freedom of the individual free men. And previous to the eighth century, you still have kind of a migration era context in which uh, we know from the Romano-Germanic laws that fundamentally the the average training, uh, like the the lowest class of troops, would were required kind of uh, bow and quiver, and um, and that's pretty much it now. There might have been even crossbows there, we don't know, but just imagine the average peasant that is called toward it and he doesn't give a damn about it because he's thinking just about surviving. And what's the difference from for him uh, between using uh, a bow and, and a crossbow, right? A crossbow also takes a lot of, kind of more time to, to reload if the, the use is um, in a noise and difficulty in that sense, if the use has to be uh, snipering, like one shot, one kill for for a particular type of hunting, may be, and it may be in this sense that th this kind of weapons developed mostly into kind of more refined environments. Maybe not just the, the poorest peasant, in fact, but some some lord that enjoyed kind of more sophisticated means to go hunting for. Uh, but the average peasant would probably opt for for, for a bow that uh, we don't even. Uh, Necessarily, necessarily think they would be so like okay, yeah, it was essentially a, a valid also for hunting people at that point. But it, what what I'm what I'm saying is that it didn't quite entail necessarily a great, um, great militarily oriented use, and, and not much because of the individual use of it. And this is where we get to the point actually, but to the collective one. Because you can even be kind of a good, sh you know, shooter w with a bow, whatever. But the point is, what are you going to do on the battlefield, even if you're like 20 bowmen in front of a single armored cavalryman that, that is charging at you? Like, well, what's the, the 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 useful range of that bow, which, which is the compactness of your ranks, which is the, you know, your your commitment when someone charges at you not to run away and to disrupt the formation because you know what's actually the, the massive firepower how's it organized how many resources are invested into uh, drilling peasants and training them to use uh, cooper co uh, cooperatively uh, the bow uh, and so on and, and to, to my uh, you know sensitivity I, I think that in early medieval times like those who started like fighting seriously, like not just raiding, uh, you know, peasant communities clashing over a, a contested uh, field, uh, border matter, but actual warfare, you know, wouldn't see like the, the archers like some of the cheapest and, and and less effective units at the end of the day. Uh, you know, the enemy is not going to sit there uh, and just getting hit. Like and even bows at this time do not have this dramatic um, penetration capability, right? But more than else, there are not the social structures to impose a major um, collective discipline to great formations of of, of, uh, of of commoners, right? Because that's what, what this stuff is turning into. Um, so that even when the peasantry was at, at its freest, let's say, it didn't quite necessarily have the cohesion to make a proficient use of of bows or crossbows for that matter uh, against a um you know the elite and that normally led war right on horseback 
armored, etc. And here, you know, it, it's really tough to, you know, there are two, like a psychological effect that is, you know, think of what it means to fight against uh, a cavalryman or however, uh, you know, an elite uh, opponent. And secondly, also, how much are the chances for you with a bow to actually hit and kill uh, a guy before he he can an armored guy that comes on horseback against you right surely happen right but i don't think that overall on average this was such a enormously feasible thing so in my opinion the bow as the crossbow um didn't i mean they were in common use like all the peasantry probably knew how to use that but there was not that extra reason that extra step to to actually use a crossbow um, because it was the, more than else the, the community cohesion that was somewhat low, and that could not withstand the, the might and the power of a you know better organized uh, elite uh, armed force in retinues that that could have a, a much more devastating impact just you know for fighting on horseback, for example. And believe me, um, you know a, a cavalry charge is something that is. Probably it, cavalry charges are probably one of the mo the, the least um, some some of the most overlooked traumatic things that can happen to someone. Like was, was one starts thinking like, oh well, but you can't stop a cavalry ship because you you don't know what what it feels to front to feel yourself in to find yourself in front of one, right? They 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 used even the the, the, the word. I always recall the, the Waterloo uh, movie in the uh, 1970s that was a co international cooperation. Basically, most of the troops, as far as I understand, were from the Red Army Reserves, right? And these were people who, some of them, they, they had kind of salted Nazi tanks barehanded during the war. And when they had to shoot the scene of, of the charge against um, the, the square uh, uh, at, at Waterloo, they they the, basically they, they even if the charge of course was was fake, but they they couldn't make those veterans stand straight in front of that cavalry charge. They couldn't even if if it was fake. Um, cavalry charge is something. It was probably one of the single most traumatizing events ever like I, I believe just shelling is worse than a cavalry charge even under being under machine gun fire is kind of not so terrifying i i presume as a, a, you know receiving a cavalry charge and and aside from this i this is of course just my opinion but um, this explains to you why the crossbow in itself doesn't matter how you know you, you could make big crossbows like more powerful ones and 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 this would be perfect especially for siege warfare right but you know crossbows cost maybe isn't it better to to pay a bit more of uh, okay it's not an enormous expense but it's still you know for for early medieval standards even you know very essential tools for for plugging the land are are costly at a point that someone cannot afford them, right? So um, the whole thing, and especially with the increase of uh, seniorial grip on society, uh, is something that probably didn't allow the development of well-organized uh, peasant militias that could make a concerted use of, of the bow. In fact, w w why do we talk about in fact, France now. Well, because not just because the first two um, uh, references what we, we said before um, about, uh, in fact, the the siege of Saint Lee, 947, and the one of Verdun in 985, are in France, in the Western Frankish Kingdom, still called like this at the time. Also, because this area in Europe was fundamentally one of the most uh, advanced, militarily speaking, right. Uh, since the time of the Carolingians, probably actually since before, since late Roman times, the only truth, um, in in the West, right? And at this point, you could say, well, but you were the one who just said, you know, that the crossbows were not used exactly because of the increase of seigneurial power. And yes, there is a paradox in this sense. I also said before, like that, that in fact, probably crossbows started developing in kind of a a bit of upper. Um, level than the average peasantry. Um, there were probably special weapons that were kind of in use, even of, of the elite. Hmm? And this is another thing that should always be borne in mind. 
that when we think about crossbows during the Middle Ages, we have this attitude as if at one point the, the crossbow was invented or discovered, like especially during the Crusades. All the story that Lich Richard Lionheart goes in, in, in the Near East and when he finds incidentally the, the Genoese crossbowmen, the, the famous battle of Arsuf with this kind of row fire, the cro Genoese crossbowmen against Turkish cavalry was so effective and Richard Lionheart gets thrilled about it and brings, allegedly, the crossbow in England for the first time, that's bollocks. Like, you know, we have seen the Picts literally use uh, crossbows in Britain in, in between the, the 7th and, and the 9th century, so you can't say that. You know, surely the Anglo-Saxons knew that stuff. Surely everybody knew that stuff by that point. Uh, I don't want to say that, of course, the 12th century, second half of the 12th century, and in England, they probably had, but we have to be somewhat cautious, a kind of a predisposition also for the bow, for bowry, for archery. I mean, and, but this is debatable as well. Um, so so the, the mass introduction of crossbows, like in that moment, so that allegedly Richard I was the, the one that kind of got more, more, more thrill in that. And But it's a very, you know, a narrow perspective and in my opinion doesn't quite explain much and we, in fact we know that the same Normans that conquered England and today we we will talk about them to um, including William the Conqueror himself used crossbows right they used them and the fact that even the Duke of Normandy himself used one actually tells you what that this stuff was used by all the nobility at least right consider what hunting is you know, like hunting you can do it of course by like piercing an animal with a javelin with a spear whatever but you know the best weapon for hunting is the bow right and why not a crossbow at that point and, um, and in fact another difficulty that we have in tracing this transformation is that it was an enormous contempt at least by official um, sources and um, kind of proto-chivalric um, and and Christian um, political propaganda, for which the, the crossbow was the, the terrible weapon nobody used because it was uh, you know disloyal and whatever. Uh, the Vatican Council bans it in the twelfth, seemingly even at the time of William the Conqueror that invaded um, England with you know with the banner of of the papacy and the blessing of the papacy. Um, uh, you know th th there was some prohibition regarding that type of weaponry employed. Um, so it's as if, in part, and this is the, also another very important factor overall, we had been blinded a little bit from seeing what, um, what, you know, how much the crossbows were fundamentally spread. Like from the 10th century, from the second half of the 10th century, um, basically we find bows, uh, crossbows, pretty much like a lot, like not literally everywhere, but you know in the way the crossbow eventually pops out from the various regions we, we understand that you know it was already developed and well developed and as a matter of fact even in northern France in these two examples of Saint-Louis and Verdun um, you understand that you know it was pretty normal right this is not about the, the, the new of an invention like ah th this guy's discovered this new weapon it was new weird weapon right no, uh, it, it's just a list saying that were a bunch of uh, missile troops that were also not probably a great deal on their own that used bows and crossbows, right? And the first reference is actually very early, like um, Richer de Rem himself actually died in 998. This was even before the year 1000. That this means that um, I mean this guy, uh, this guy's gr grandfather's actually had seen the last Carolingians, right? So um, it's very interesting to see, as for many other transformations that we often credit, in fact, to, to, to the 11th and 12th century, that the 10th, the 10th century is, is a century that requires a lot, a lot, a lot more, but massive more attention than, massively more attention than it's been usually given. Uh, too. Not because there were major changes, but because in fact we, can, we can't track the, um, the the first developments of certain s stuff that probably even pre predated the 10th century, as we've seen in the case of Pictish um, crossbows, but can help us understand a lot, right? Uh, the 10th century is also the century of the birth of 
of the militia of the night of knighthood like not probably of, of knighthood itself because that's goes we can't trace back to the proto in the Europeans even but but and I'm not kidding if you have re listened to my videos about uh, the origins of chivalry and stuff like that, you know what I'm talking about it's actually correct and um, there's a massive literature about this topics um, but uh, I don't know what I was saying well but Anyhow, that um, you know, the, the, bir the birth of the mil militia proper, as it was called in Latin, that is in fact the, the, the knights as we, we know them, as a social class of a professional uh, warriors, right? That it's very different from what existed before, in the sense that now there is a, a collective training that is, drama is rocketing to the stars, right? And it's all about mounted warfare and the developing of this heavily armored cavalry. and uh, the recognition of a political and social status attached to it, right, that starts dominating uh, parts of Europe, and especially France, northern France, because this this is where it had stemmed from. This was the land of the ancient Neustria. It was one of the most highly stratified European countries since the late Roman times. Uh, the Franks had inherited this uh, area of Gallia Belgica from the Romans that wasn't actually a, a big deal. I mean, yeah, there were enough cities, it wasn't that bad. But the most, it w but it also it was kind of much less, Rom uh, less Romanized than Southern Gaul mm, um, that has comparable levels to the ones of Italy itself, telling the truth, or Southern Spain. But um, it it had remained... You know, its m m socio-economical structures had remained relatively intact from ancient times, in s especially in certain areas. I mean, all the, I mean, the Romans had kept an entire, like, eight legions stash stationed for for centuries along the Rhine. Uh, there, were, there was a huge amount of agricultural resources. There was uh, systems of production that was attached to it. Basically, the Franks got in their hands without much of a um, you know, actually sharing it with the local Gallo-Roman sen senatorial class, but then maintaining this aristocratic model to live on, right? And uh, and at this point, in fact, in like in the 10th century, northern France is the hub of chivalry and knighthood. And what all would evolve like in this broader, let's say, Frankish political military culture that will embrace basically... Um, up to Russia, like the, the the whole Europe at one point, because from here, from the mm, first of all, all the post-Carolingian countries had had inherently this stuff, like France, today's France, Benelux, Germany, uh, Central and Northern Italy, from and eventually from there it would spread basically everywhere. Like the Normans that come exactly from Northern France in this sense, and that are fully Frankish in culture now. Like they're the the same exact identical copy of the Franks at this point. They just were genetically coming some of them at least in part uh, from uh, from the north, from Norway, from Denmark. But now they fought in the same exact identical manner than the French did. Right? The Norman accomplishments in this sense are Frankish accomplishments. Norman cavalry is Frankish cavalry. There is no difference of any single sort. By definition, um, and, and and that's the highest uh, military culture in Western Europe, right? And the Normans conquer England, they conquer Sicily, uh, they uh, the Frankish um, knights, uh, you know, fight in the Reconquista. Eventually, they expand further, you know, from Germany into the Baltic. Uh, t tomorrow, hopefully, we'll talk about that uh, with the Crusades, also in the Near East, and there is a chivalrization, let's say, on the Frankish model of military culture and so on, that will extend this stuff everywhere. And incidentally, uh, this is the same area in which crossbows start developing more, right? And it's a bit difficult to say why or how, right? Um, because actually this similar stuff, you know, that in in the following centuries, actually, the the place of greatest development of crossbow warfare will be uh, central and northern Italy, um, and this area, for example, was um, was also you know quite ex exposed to like Byzantine military culture as well, and Frankish one, 
because it was actually overlapping the two you know, uh, at their boundaries. And, um, and in there, instead, you find actually lots of crossbowmen and also, you know, lots of trained bodies of, of, of crossbowmen that are actually very, very, very effective. They're famous. I mean, in fact, the Genoese crossbowman, Richard Lionheart, in, in the 12th century, was the product, essentially, of Frankish military culture, and he combines it with this, you know, stuff that he seemingly had uh, never seen that amount on that in that amount in in the way he had when he had been acquainted with, with Italians. So it's mm, and why? Well, because Italy at that point had city states, which is very different from a f from a feudal world, but still these two areas have a lot of contacts, a lot of communication, and it seems the crossbow basically developed a bit in parallel between these two areas to to be to spread further light. Right. So at that point, you realize that if things like Manu Ballistas from ancient models, etc., were still around during the early Middle Ages, what actually made the difference in here is not the technology in itself, right? Because, yeah, aside from the trigger, the loading system, like, um, etc., et you know, the concept is otherwise very simple. Here, what really changes it is the availability of resources and how many, uh, how much resources you can invest not much in the technology in itself but of picked bodies of men that you have to train and feed and, and maintain and pay um, uh, to be effective with this missile uh, weapons right because crossbows and bows in, in the middle ages have never alone uh, defeated cavalry as many people actually presume like because I presume there are lots of people who think that I don't know the longbow did the longbow didn't longbow was, longbow was part of a combined tactic that allowed of course to stop cavalry charges but n d don't forget the men at arms and foot that, you know with pikes and you know blunt weapons that, that stood against uh, that took the impact because if, if it had been just about archers <laughs> they would have not made it you know, you know those were not machine guns they were bows right and actually actually bows are not even meant normally to to actually pierce um armor uh, right if you take like lots of shots of course some splinter and stuff can get through and cause damages so you can't know what can happen on battlefield you can wound a horse that usually is unarmored um, you can do a lot of things, but it's not a matter of the single weapon. It's a matter of how many people shoot at the same time, uh, at the same rate, because shooting, like, one arrow in, in 60 seconds is not like uh, shooting 60 arrows in, uh, you know, it's, uh, okay, one, hour, one arrow at a second for 60 seconds is not just like shooting one one arrow, uh, 60 arrows in, in one single second every every minute in that, that point, because the second will have a, a much greater impact, even if, if the, the same exact number of arrows uh, uh, in, in the same amount of time, right? Um, and it requires training, it requires discipline, and, and it requires money. Money. Training equates to money. Training is extremely expensive. That's why, actually, knights dominated the battlefield. You can measure it on the base of the amount of wealth of, 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 of price that their training costed. Right? We are talking about thousands of people breaking their backs just for making a night fighting a day on a battlefield. Because the forces involved, the strengths, the, the energies are what it takes, you know, and, and we're talking about medieval times. The crop rate is dramatically low. You you can't you have very few surplus. So um it's very useful to reason in these terms to first of all understand why certain weapons evolved and they they and, and they appear in different times. It's like the pike. Take the pike. The pike exists since prehistory. Like literally, pikes are present in every single military context in human history um, before firearms, you know, take completely over. Like in the West, in the 18th century, when the pike disappears from the battlefield, but still, I don't know. During the French Revolution, they used it theoretically. The pike is always there, right? Um, Yes, there were pikemen in French Revolution, like <laughs> in desperate moments, especially I think it was French revolutionary forces, citizens, something like that. They they sometimes were equipped with pikes, um, and um, the point of uh, even the Vandans revolting at one point, uh, yeah, that there was something like that. But the point is, how many times you see pike prevailing on, on the field? We usually 
in Hellenistic times with the Macedonian phalanges and then in, in the Renaissance times up to, you know, like for two centuries or so. Um, why? Because people had reinvented or rediscovered the pike? This is not how history of technology works. It's political and social. That's literally what it is. It's not because people were stupid, didn't know how to use a pike. This is probably uh, the greatest trouble we have today is that you know, we think that medievals were a bunch of morons because uh, they ne never found out that they could use a pike against cavalry. Wow! So one day one guy discovered it and they could defeat the, the cavalry. Yeah, no, it, it didn't work like that. Um, it, it's a matter of political and social cohesion, which is wholly an outer matter, and this is actually the only thing that counts in battlefield, right? Because you can't find even a bunch of peasants killing an armored knight if they're angry enough because what matters in warfare is not what you have in your hands but how much you want to rip apart the guts of the person you, front, you have in front of you that's literally the single most important thing let's always remember it that's what von Clausewitz teaches war is a struggle between moral forces material stuff comes later right it's not that it's not important but it comes second um, so this is the same way we can roughly explain why crossbows at this point start being re-employed um, and re-revived. But the interesting thing about it, though, is that, and this is also a bit of a, I made a video uh, like uh, like three weeks, weeks ago or a bit more, um, about the prejudices we have about Western warfare this time in pre-Crusades times. Like, there is all a branch of Western historiography, actually, that itself that said that, you know, if the Europeans had not ventured out there during the Crusades in the Near East and whatever, they would have not evolved in, in the way they did. Actually, all what we are discovering in military history right now tells us that the West was actually at least as advanced, and by that time, okay, up to the 12th century, surely as advanced, without m much of a difference, actually, to Byzantine and uh, Islamic warfare, right? There is no proof of any kind that actually um, there was an inferiority in the quality of the breeds, in cavalry tactics, in uh, in this case, even in archery, in, in bowmen, uh, you know, and crossbows, right? And, in fact, one great passage that I would like to read with you today is from the Alexiad of Anna Komnena that as you know um, was one of the greatest um, authors in, in Byzantine literature also daughter of Alexius the first Komnenus and that's what the Alexiad is in fact about her father and, um, and she writes something very very interesting at the um, actually at the beginning of of the tw uh, of the 12th century so right after the like uh, the first cruise so when the um the the frankish armies had literally crossed the byzantine empire to go and they they were acquainted you know and she saw you know she she was also kind of thrilled she she liked the crusaders this guys um and uh, even of course if the byzantines had and vice versa they all had all these prejudices towards one another and, and in fact, the Byzantines thought that the Franks, this uh, northern like French, uh, Belgians, etc., how they were, were kind of um, barbarians, right? That that's the the typical standard. But there there is something that they recognized, like the Muslims did, by the way, that these guys were were great about war, I, and there was they were basically the most courageous of all the of all the peoples out there. Which is very meaningful, and there is actually a lot of evidence that I also talked about in that in that video about uh, poor the myth of poor Western mouths. I think the title is that like that. Um, uh, that I want to thank your uh, Gasman also for uh, for it, since I quoted largely from from his um, from one of his articles um, that in fact they were the best. On horseback, right? But today we talk about crossbows, and in fact, there is this beautiful passage about the, cro the crossbow that Anna Komnena uh, wrote, and uh, it it says something like that. And then she talks about the crossbow, which here is told like in a bit of uh, exaggerated terms, 
like this crossbow seems can do everything. Of course, it wasn't quite like that, and uh, Anna was an extremely intelligent and well thought and, and talented woman. Uh, but naturally, there were certain uh, stylistic models that she, you know, she attained to, even certain exaggerations, w which is normal in the literature of the time. So we don't have to take, you know, literally everything she says as real, like like any other source, of course. And she writes something like this: um, "This crossbow, which is really a crossbow, like because it's like a cross, right? Is a bow of the barbarians, quite unknown to the Greeks." And it is not stretched by the right hand pulling the string, whilst the left pulls the bow in a contrary direction. But he who stretches this warlike and very far-shooting weapon must lie, one might say, almost on his back, and apply both feet strongly against the semicircle of the bow, and with um, his two hands pull the string, with all his might in the contrary uh, direction. In the middle of the string is a socket, a cylindrical kind of cup fitted to the string itself, and about as long as an arrow of considerable size, which reaches from the string to the very middle of the bow. And through these arrows of many sorts are shot out. The arrows used with this bow are very short in length, but very thick, fitted in front with a very heavy iron tip, and in discharging them the string shoots them out with enormous violence and force, and whatever these darts chance to hit, they do not fall back, but they pierce through a shield, then cut through a heavy iron corselet, and wing their way through and out at the, uh, at the other side. So violent and ineluctable is the discharge of arrows of this kind. Such an arrow has been known to pierce a bronze statue, and if it, it hits the wall of a very large town, the point of the arrow either protrudes on the inner side, or it buries itself in the middle of the wall and is lost. Um, such, then, is this monster of a crossbow and barely a devilish invention, and the wretched man was, was struck by it dies without feeling anything, not even feeling the blow, however strong it be. So, um, this is beautifully written, by the way, and secondly, it's uh, extremely um, useful, like it's a very important witness that we have, at, uh, uh, let's say at a relatively early time, about this weapon that naturally from the 10th century had probably somewhat evolved but already in here displayed already by this time it displayed such incredible effects you know it could pierce through a bronze statue a thick uh, iron uh, corselet and it doesn't bounce um, which is also can happen you know so this is why it's kind of a bit mythically explained but you know, let's say here it should explain. You know, if it hits straight, etc. Objectively, yes, the the crossbow did pierce through mail armor. That at this time there is no plate armor, right? Plate. Uh, man, actually, th there was. Telling you the truth, the, the, especially in the Byzantine context, we are told even by certain authors there were certain plates. But you know, it was like it's also for the chest of horses. But you know that most armor was actually male, right? And what is interesting is that, you see, even, for example, the Turkish composite bow here hit the Crusaders, the first battle of Durilium, you, you could see all these Frankish knights all pierced by 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 arrows, <laughs> so many arrows stuck into their corselets, that actually didn't kill them because they had a lot of gambeson underneath, a, you know, very thick padded uh, coat that pr protected them, so, but the, the, the crossbow objectively could pierce very violently through through mail the point of you know, yeah definitely wounding vital organs underneath ar arriving to deal with that and uh, this stuff yeah it could even s uh, stick into a city wall <laughs> at the point it could you know you couldn't see that and this detail I think it was very uh, fascinating because uh, it tells you by how at the time naturally this is not really talking about walls like I don't think <laughs> You know, a crossbow bolt could could smash into, you know, the Theodosian walls and remaining uh, stuck in, in into them. But evenly, you know, with dirt and wood, you know, yeah, 
the, consider this, what the crossbows could have developed like in the moment, like the 10th century, 11th century, or, or better redeveloped when the, the the, yeah, they were, they were starting to be like the very first like stone fortifications in a kind of a you know a certain fact. But the majority was uh, was actually moat and bailey castles with dirt and 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 wood and, and nothing nothing else. So something you have to consider. Also, in later times in history, like rifled guns in the 19th century in a world, especially in colonial context where everything was built like in wood, you know, was terrific weapon like of course the crossbow is different but just for saying con consider the context not just for example the um the uh, a human target but even a like a protection like wood etc so uh, what is however more meaningful about this witness of anna komnen is the uh, surprise that this stuff uh, produced to the byzantines like it's as if they uh they had never seen it or at least they were she was writing about it as if it was something new and also something very cool that she says is that this was kind of a devilish invention right which sounds very much like what the actually the western stereotype was about this weapons at least ideally right here i don't know how moralistically it is meant but uh, the concept is basically the same right um so this tells us something very important is that the, the, the Western Europeans and these crusaders coming mostly from in fact from from Central Europe at this point um, between the 11th and 12th century most crusaders were kind of French speaking um, and their Italian shippers and helpers let's say um, you know were mm, coming from a strictly Latin, like Latin Germanic context, right? From from an environment that had uh, kind of a similar matrix, right? Um, and that's so the development of this technology, right? We know the crossbows were actually used even in the Near East, etc. But even to that, and I w we will make actually a video about that. You know how much did the Westerners uh, use the crossbow before they got? into uh, the Near East during the Crusades, because that's also very important. How much was this used like in, in Spain or in um, on other frontiers, let's say? Because the, the answer might be surprising. Many times you say, oh well, I don't know, the Italians got the stuff from the Near East because they were the early, you know, they, they started trading more in intensively with the Near East and Egypt, etc. So they, they got acquainted to it and they took it. But, you know, if you look at how, I don't know, in the 11th century, the Italians were using crossbows, especially in naval warfare, and you, you realize that, you know, the Muslims didn't quite have the same stuff. Or maybe they had, but, you know, the, the Italians came at that point to, to dominate in a way that. Uh, the crossbow in, in general in the Christian world would become much more prominent than in the Islamic world. In the Islamic world you find up to the end of the Middle Ages and even beyond still the slight um, horse archers that dominate the field and that also evolve, by the way, their um, bows uh, technologically to cope with Western armor and probably also with Western Western missile fire that was pretty damn effective as Battle of Sof proved and how, you know, these Western crossbows were already uh, proving, in fact, by by themselves. So, it's... in, in I, I also believed originally that there could be this motivation, but the more I'm approaching to these topics and the more I realize that there is probably a, a completely rever a reversed picture that we have to take into consideration. Uh, at the point that it, they were not just even, but it's as if the West was already well awake before the Crusades, aside from what paradoxically the same Western historiographical picture has kind of drawn, right? Like, no, this was kind of a stuff the West copied from from the East because they were just a bunch of barbarians who were civilized by uh, Mediterranean civilization. It, it didn't quite happen like that. Um, and and we r dramatically underestimate the West in, in early medieval times, and that's our greatest problem, that we we often don't see how much, like, classical, Christian, and pagan civilization gave 
to what it is in fact still today Western uh, civilization in, in the capacity of synthesis and of the resilience of, of this, uh, certain communities, their in ingenuity, their um, their open-mindedness, telling the truth, because you can't have, you know, w when you go in the East, you see that there are kind of traditional customs that are kind of the self-perpetrating for, for centuries and centuries. The West changes, the West does change, it definitely does learn a lot also from the East, but there was something about it that had, um, uh, Europe was not just growing, Europe was expanding, which is very different. Right. Also, the the Muslim world was 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 growing. Also, the Byzantine world was growing, but they were not quite expanding at, at the point. So, uh, now it's a very complicated talk telling the truth. We will have to make a video dedicated specifically to it. But just never underestimate certain contexts. Never think at the Middle Ages, the uh, medieval Europe, like a dark flatland when nothing happened, because it's actually against every historical evidence that we have at this point in history. Um, so, mm, relatively to the spread of the crossbow proper, like, what can we what can we say about it uh, further? Like, mm, I, 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 yeah, there, there is one point actually, that before I didn't end my explanation of why, you know, there, there was um, the crossbows actually spreading into uh, areas like, in fact, northern France and England at this point. Well, why it originated from, especially northern France, seemingly? Well, my answer is, I would say, there was a mix of um, that we could extend this also to the f to the county of Flanders in the Italic Kingdom, because they, they were doing this. Like, in, in the core land of the Capetian dynasty, and, in, and therefore in the cradle of the old, the Middle Ages as we think it, from in terms of of the Frankish core land, and the, where Gothic would expand from all the, 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 you know, the, the, the most typically feudal Europe that we know, um, there were probably picked bodies of trained crossbowmen, right, that appear, um, you know, also in later times, like the, the feudal elite needed crossbowmen as well, right, in good numbers, um, mercenaries originally, but eventually, you know, really even kind of semi-permanent units of crossbowmen that were used, especially for siege warfare, because siege warfare was like the standard out there, pitch battles were quite rare, even if like the whole world um, in in feudal Europe was organized around the elite and the, the mounted fighter, the the armored cavalry, uh, the, the armored knight. Uh, objectively, his employment in open field, um, in normal circumstances with the congua and this thickly packed formations on the flatland was somewhat rare. The majority of operations was notoriously like just today, telling the truth. Uh, some things never never change about siege warfare, right? And siege warfare is the the natural environment for the crossbow, right? Because it's long, it's a war of attrition, and you take your time. You're protected. You can aim at one point. Uh, even um, as you know, military architecture develops. You know, with this very narrow windows for shooting. You know, from the in internal side being kind of narrower than opening uh, towards the outside to to have more you know um, uh, you know angle of, of fire in uh, against what was outside and all um, but uh, it starts being something probably also out there in open field because in open field also you have a, usually uh, not just cavalry but also a lot of um, the uh, you know the infant, you know the, the the fight was not about cavalry action. Battles lasted even for an entire day, and the actual melee lasted um, a few minutes, right? And uh, if each time it could last for like very few. So most of the times was actually spent skirmishing and exchanging projectiles against um, thickly. You know, think about infantry usually and trying to soften the enemy ranks up and uh, 
There was all a technology developing also for that specific context, like larger shields, better armor. Um, and um, so crossbow warfare had a great impact overall. Like before firearms, possibly that was the single most influencing um, um, let's say element alone, especially impressively for being a, a technology, right? Just a weapon. And uh, a few other weapons are so comparably effective in history, so, so you know, influencing overall. Um, so that is my explanation. What we we have to rema uh, remind then is that northern France, however, was pretty close to the county of Flanders. It was at the time, in fact, part of the French kingdom. And that was famous for its um, commoners, for its uh, city-states, for the fact that were the kind of, um, kind of wealthy middle classes that actually were nothing about war. Like these were people who didn't take a hand a weapon in their hands, excuse me, uh, in a lifetime. But every once in a while they were called to defend their own rights and, and some of them, uh, and, and crossbow in this sense was very practical because these guys had the money to produce them and even partly the, the technology because the craftsmen and all these people you know, about mechanism and stuff were in the cities. Um, they were mm, relatively easy weapons to use. So that was kind of stereotypically the burgers uh, weapon, right? The same goes in Italy, that's exactly the same thing. There are wealthy city-states that dealt, you know, this crossbows in, in, in large numbers, in massive numbers, and they, the crossbow comes to have a great impact in local warfare. Um, so, technically, the, the Flemish were vassals of the King of France, right? Even though at this time, toward the, the 10th and the 11th century, you know, <laughs> say that the French kingdom was yet to be uh, ensured in, in its existence, like it was starting to form. I made a video about the making of the Capetian monarchy, which we, we, we saw how progressively the you know, Capetian monarchy was kind of a miracle, <laughs> if you think about it, were more eligible kingdoms to survive as, as autonomous monarchies than 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 uh, the Western Frankish one during the the ninth and the tenth centuries, right? But let's say that there were also Flemish crossbowmen around as mercenaries, right? So if you wanted crossbowmen, skilled crossbowmen, you would use those guys, right? And we know that the Flemish were present even at the conquest of England uh, in the army of of William the Conqueror, like. And that, therefore, there was a bit of a... Th these are very close regions. I mean, Normandy, in the Ile de France, uh, uh, Flanders, uh, Britain, etc. Bretagne also as well. Um, the, uh, there was actually a lot of... Th this, was, this is an area, especially Normandy, that is in the midst of many different military cultures that probably was very open also to experimentation. And that's why I would like to talk a little bit about the Normans again, because this is an area that, that, that you know produced a very interesting changes over time. For example, the 10th century is also the time in which, um, between in fact France and Norm and, and excuse me and Germany, we start seeing the famous kite shield, drop shield, um, drop shaped shield appearing. Then many people say, oh, this stuff was used already by the Arabs, by the Byzantines. Well, it, the appearance is almost contemporary. Like, objectively, the Ottonian manuscript appears later uh, with this type of shield, etc. But also in that white passing from the typical round shield, like from the Viking era mo kind of type, to th that one. Right? I is it more about mounted warfare increasing, especially in these two areas, in the Ottonian Germany and... Uh, uh, 10th century France is a place where that was developing intensely, yes. Uh, but it could be, in fact, also because of the increase of uh, of bow, of archery, and even the crossbows, possibly, right? The need of defending the leg. Um, at this point, without investing in actual iron in uh, that, because Europe was still a bit poor f for having that's so better wood, and also probably the weapons were not as powerful, like, you know, if you take the the Genoese crossbow of the 13th century you have something like 260 
pounds of traction, I think it's better for you to be to have armor uh, at your legs rather than a shield, right? It also can hamper your the movements of, of your arm. So it, it's a sum of elements and factors that need to be considered. And uh, Normandy, as we've seen before, was objectively a copy of the Western Franks. Right. This is not an ideal. I know that people get mad about this stuff because there are all the Viking fans that want to say, ah, no, the Normans were Normans because they were true Vikings inside. They were just, yeah, buying a little bit of Frankish shit. No, they were identical to Western Franks. I mean, literally identical, right? As we were saying before, some of them came genetically from somewhere else, but that's the only difference. Here they spoke French, they wrote the same script, they had the same social structure, etc. Right. The great difference they make objectively is that from Normandy they they conquer places like uh, England and Sicily that were not feudal lands because there wasn't feudalism in there. And therefore they, they managed to centralize and therefore more uh, than they could do in France that was completely messed up from this point of view. And to create kind of more centralized systems with a particular character, but if you, if you look at their armies, they were literally the same thing. Then there were also the English was tend to say, well, you know, the Normans were a bit different. And in fact, there is this stereotype um, that you know, f the not just England proper, b um, but also even Normandy had even more had a, a greater tradition of archery before the most famous developments of the 14th century. Right. This is something uh, that cannot be proven, actually, as far as I understand. I mean, there is evidence that, of course, the Normans did make use of uh, the bow, um, largely. Um, we see it on the Bayeux tapestry when we don't find crossbows, though, and the reason may be objectively that they had been forbidden by uh, the Pope nominally, which means that quite surely at Hastings the, the work. Norman crossbowmen, actually it's certain, but the problem is that the, in the an official source like the Bayeux tapestry could be, they didn't want to 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 picture it. But it's not just about the papacy; it's also about the uh, you know the, the properly Frankish culture that point the Normans had for which the crossbow was kind of an infamous weapon. But you say, well, but there is the, cr the bow as well, and you find even dismounted knights with bow. Yeah, so it's possible, actually, that the Normans had culturally a bit more of open-mindedness than the uh, like th than the Western Franks regarding to these problems, but it's debatable as well. Actually, if you look at the at the Eddas or the Sagas, you find always these heroes like yeah, lack. Did they they fight one, uh, one against the other face to face? The the duel, the stuff that actually chivalry will take from 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 this source as well as from I don't know David and Goliath from the Bible and all this model that will form the courtly ethics and about um, the two champions fi loyally fighting etc. But you see that the Germanic hero at one point is always killed um, in a kind of a Mm, unworthy fashion, usually pierced, think about Siegfried, pierced from, from the back uh, treacherously, and that's the typical thing, which actually tells us not just anthropological, but strictly militarily speaking, that that environment had actually a lot of missile troops, or better, you know at least missile weapons were important at that point, so that uh, you know, of all the possible deaths that the hero would, would could suffer you know that's the one of the cord that hits him from from uh, the behind with a missile fire right and that's okay that 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 house also has a deeper meaning it's about the destiny and fate and the fact not having trust in you know in fortune and whatever and the fact that human life doesn't count the, the, the destiny has already designed certain stuff Something you find even in the Iliad, you know, it's the old the Indo-European tradition that, and not only that one, it talks about this stuff. But that still means subjectively and quite explicitly sometimes there were lots of archers out there. Um, so, I don't know, maybe uh, the Normans were, I don't know, maybe more open-minded regarding to that, we don't know. I personally don't think that the, there is actual, any historical evidence for... Um, a greater spread of bows in Normandy than in the rest of France. Uh, it could be, in part, that Normandy retained maybe uh, 
compared to the Ile de France or Champagne or Anjou or other more kind of French, um, properly you know ethnically French than uh, and politically and socially Frankish dominated areas. Kind of a bit more of uh, let's say of less social stratification, for which means that maybe the commoners were slightly stronger and there was more emphasis on the hair bun and therefore uh, stronger bodies of men in terms of uh, even of this type of uh, of weapons being used right actually we see that um this um you know like archery was used stereotypically among the migration era uh, people so we've seen before in the lowest strata of the population that in terms of wealth that made up surely the, the, the majority of of the population at some point or maybe not but you know uh, at least there were surely always a lot of people like in that condition maybe not even freemen they were called uh the fact to not even freemen uh freemen called with bow and quiver to fight right so maybe normandy was a bit still more like that like bit more primitive culturally like next but n not much because of the vikings themselves that had settled there but even look at around like yeah from in the east you have county flanders that is pretty wealthy telling the truth but if you look in the west you have Brittany, which is still wild it's still still celtic there's a, a particular type of warfare actually seemingly the normans in normandy learned how to ride well um because the the britons taught them right if the britons carried out uh, feigned f uh, flights you know and um this tactics that eventually would become kind of better known seemingly during the crusades but i personally think they were already out there they were simply not sponsored just to find them in countries like Brittany because they were less feudalized in fact in character and they were less hypocritical about what they showed out there um as well as it's possible that england as such had remained uh with less social segmentation for which you find even less cavalry on average uh this m greater you know m bodies of uh, of infantry and therefore m more coordinated bow shooting uh, en masse it's possible but actually with with the norman conquest and what you see in the 12th and 13th century I made a video about this like 13th century english armies we we saw there that we can't say that we can't say that england at this point nor normandy had kind of a greater inclination towards bow warfare like and what happened in the 14th century was actually carried out by the crown like it was literally edward the, the first the second and the third who um implemented the system from from the top not because typical uh, English warfare was about that, nor the Welsh one. Absolutely not. Don't come up with that thing. The English took the the bow from the Welsh because it's 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 garbage. It it doesn't exist. It's a pure myth. Uh, it's been debunked uh, by every serious study about the topic. Every, still, everybody believes that. It's disgusting. It's utterly disgusting. I mean, it's not that the Welsh bowmen were not good. They were, like, um, and um, but th there is no proof. Uh, absolutely that they were kind of better or worse than the English ones they already had their good ones and also they were paid much less during the the Welsh and Scottish wars in the 13th century and that tells you something um, and and yeah don't mention Geraldus Cambrensis because that's that's been debunked exactly starting from that because you know it's just a statement like there was a long bowman in, in, in Wales like Wow, great, yeah. Long bowmen existed since prehistory basically everywhere, so what's the deal, right? Um, it's a myth, now let's be honest, about the the mutuation from the Welsh that uh, of of long uh, you know of long bow tradition in the English army. It's, it does not it there is no single historical proof of this. But aside from that it is objectively possible, but it's basically impossible as well to measure, and that's the problem. That this areas of northern Europe being more segmented, uh, uh, excuse me, less uh, stratified socially, maybe had l a, a greater importance of infantry in some regards. But you know, if you take Anglo-Norman warfare, they were basically an exact copy of the French.
that that's it so i i don't think so and actually it would be interesting to deepen like the the study about this but they're very early times and uh, we have very few information right but there is some possibility look at that video if you're interested uh 13th century english infantry that's the title now i remember um so uh, yeah on the bio tapestry we don't really have the crossbow right and we we have seen it uh possibly was banned who knows um although we do know however that William of Poitiers refers to Duke William using crossbows. Hmm. And that's interesting. And there is also another account of same Battle of Hastings by Guy uh, de Amiens who, uh, who refers to the in Latin to the so called ballistantes. Um even though this can be kind of interpreted as other types of troops, also slingers actually, um and also is not a such, uh, uh, such a reliable source as William of Poitiers, right? So mm, it's um, it's kind of difficult to to say more about these topics. Like if you today, I tried to expand a little bit to bit more bit more entertaining, but uh, the 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 reality of of the picture is that we have just this written sources a very few finds about relatively late later times about crossbows um we we we, we do lack especially a dimensional perspective even more than data right you know i i have a huge respect for wu studies weapons uh archaeologists etc but they um there is somehow um a, 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 a too technological attention like even this of course i don't have to to say this to to the experts but even the experts usually are people who study the 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 weapon as the material object and 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 they concentrate on it because objectively there is more to say about this what i was saying before that we, for example we have a problem in defining what was um um you know lacking uh, in um in terms of definitions like for example excuse me i, I was thinking about something else i mean we we we're very stereotypical saying ah this is a cross but like there were different types um and but and therefore there is further field for explanation in there but at the same time it seems like it's all about the object and not about the context right and actually about the context we have a lot of other things to say and in as you know on Schwerpunkt I mostly talk about in terms of saying you know if the absence of evidence is not evidence of, of absence right you know if, uh, if there are no uh there is no evidence of a certain weapon used in a certain place but you know that all the places around used it and you know that this is a kind of an early time and um and it's you, at that point you kind of realize it's normal that maybe you don't have an evidence and that you're being particularly lucky to find the stuff you have elsewhere and 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 that point might be just not be documented because it, it's, it you know there is a few sources after all but it doesn't mean that the, the the weapon was not there. Sometimes, academically, we stop there. Like, we enter a time in Western historiography in which we start doubting about literally everything at the point that there are entire branches of <laughs> of uh, disciplinary branches that are meant to tear down every form of classification. Well, I don't think this is very healthy, personally speaking, because it's healthy to to like always to doubt always to be able to put into discussion your own beliefs but you can't start from the point that something since something is just an hypothesis um it's it, it you have you don't even have to think about it like because it's it, you can't prove it okay useless no because there are certain hypotheses that are objectively more likely than others right and you can measure that practically and that's what most of the history is actually about 
So I personally um, don't like how we focus a bit too much, especially regarding weapons, to just to the weapon itself and not about a lot of other things we could observe by broadening the, the, the our horizons. Also because this is a product of a hyper-specialization, right, that we have to, like we don't have to push forward too much because we fear that otherwise we will not say the, the, the comma right, right, and the, this is this is not so good. We, we need a bit more of generalists to to, to realize certain aspects that I think are important to be seen in this dimension, a strictly dimensional perspective. Um, so this is more or less what I want to say, and, and I would like also to add that objectively the fact that crossbow appears is not a big deal. First of all, because it seemingly reappeared just in our sources, and very likely in early medieval times it, w it had always remained there, like. Um, and it would improve dramatically, like in later times, even compared to classical times. So it's it's really not so strange after all. Um, it's it's remarkable, it's interesting, whatever. But it's not that crossbow at that point is the novelty in itself. Once again, it's a matter of context. You have to look at the context and realize that a lot of other things were changing together with the crossbow, to make you really realize the whole picture and saying, wow that's what makes the difference in like avoiding stereotypes like saying in fact starting from single weapons ah saying s certain amenities l such as I don't know the, mm, uh, the, the the westerners got better cavalry tactics or, or cr the crossbow from the crusade because all we know about uh, in from this broader perspective tells us that that is not true right and that's because we start from the single weapons and with single material dimension we don't look at what the, the more concrete moral deal was in terms of forces in war. Secondly, um, there's also another thing that maybe we can't conclude with, um, that is how crossbowmen were first, firstly depicted. For example, if you look in Romani uh, um, Romanesque capitals, you uh, you start seeing, especially from the 12th century, and there is a study of a girl that I don't remember. Wait a second, I can't give you, because you can read her article at that point, that she actually talks of, um, about history of art in this sense. She's not exactly a uh, polymologist as far as I understood, but she made this interesting study about capitals in... Um, she's a Spanish, if I'm not wrong. She studies stuff from, from Spain and France, and she... Oh, let me... Uh, here, here it is. It's crouching... Um, Crossbowmen in early 12th century sculpture, nasty British and short-lived iconography. Uh, the author is Therese Martin from Madrid, here she says. And you can find this on academia.edu, right? And it, it's interesting. And it shows, I haven't even full, had the time to fully read the article, but it says, basically, because I, I was googling something else, I found it. And, but it shows you here just plenty of pictures, and I will leave you the uh, okay, yeah, the the link uh, in 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 the des video description later that shows you how uh, ridiculously, objectively, these crossbowmen were represented uh, in this R Romanesque art, and and she, mm, as far as I understood, wants us to make uh, to make us understand that these crossbows were. Of course, they were uh, they were literally drawn like that. Like they had you to to crouch, and and this was very complicated. To in fact, even think about this on a battlefield, right? It's not extremely complicated, but you need a bit of space of moving, etc. And in art, crossbowmen were represented so ridiculously, like crouched, like little monsters, like like little dwarfs, right? And and they were probably just ridiculizing this commoners, right, and some of them were not actually framed under the feudal hierarchy, then he said was the one that was building this um, this churches and and commissioning this art, and because they were scared, actually, they were scared about masses of, of 
of, of this is from the 12th century like from the 12th and 13th century the commoners starting being much more aggressive like these are the centuries of greatest dominance of heavy cavalry in western um, in western battlefields but still infantry develops in parallel and in fact the crossbow starts being kind of more effective um, uh, knight's armor improves seemingly because especially of crossbow fire and therefore these guys are the, like the the knightly elite says you know this, this you know the knightly elite reputed um these whoever fought on foot as inferior uh, up to almost at the point of let's say proto racial inferiority like they thought they were kind of inferior beings because they were not noblemen and therefore they fought on foot but they were also troubled by them because they knew the crossbows actually were pretty damn powerful and they were kind of scared and wanted to make these capitals as a sort of political propaganda against the uh, the commoner with the, with the bow which is essentially a cohort albeit we know as we've seen that even you know the the top nobility used crossbows just like William the Conqueror in that actually um, more than this actually especially the, the the nobility at that point knew how to use this stuff on horseback I mean we think that horse archery is something that reappears later like um, first of all between the 11th I think uh, I mean you have to think uh, openly that as soon as crossbows were introduced of course they were immediately used on horseback as well like immediately because that's literally what happens. In, in you, you know perfectly well that in the 11th century Norman warfare, the same knights were you know usually dismi sometimes dismounted because cavalry had not yet reached in the 11th century the peaks of the 12th and the 13th especially, so that cavalry charges were kind of uh, like sometimes infantry were still a thing, right? The Saint Hastings. Basically, the Anglo-Saxons lost, as far as we understand, because they broke the, the infantry line that had successfully repelled um, the, the Norman cavalry charge. So, in the 11th century, the uh, cavalry actually doesn't have the uh, unmatched dominance of the battlefield yet. Um, so, actually, uh, going especially hunting, etc., this nobleman would all know how to use a bow on horseback or even a crossbow on horseback and you shouldn't be surprised to see in the 13th century as a secondary weapon a crossbow it was normal for knights to be equipped even with crossbows I'm not kidding it was very very common as far as we can speculate and of course the knight at this point was specializing in the shock charge formation um, and that was the, the first thing on the battlefield so once again always think about the collective use and not the individual use right of, of the warrior or the fighter but but they had they were equipped as well with other weapons and, and knights are always remembered the peak of professionalism feudal societies have, have in knights the peak of professionalism of, of entire military history which means that these guys were trained literally in every single weapons that existed at the time and they knew how to master it at every level like you can't say this this is a knight he's just better at the sword and the lance than at the crossbow because this guy was the best person out there that knew how to use a, a crossbow way better even than a commoner that in fact usually didn't train even if maybe maybe had it available because he was a merchant who could pay for it right even a knight fought, uh, trained uh, all his life using every single kind of weapon out there, right? So, yeah, all right. There is a lot to to say, but this is the concept. This is the general line, and this is how we um, we I think at these problems like, and of course, um, probably you know. The question is more complicated by certain standards, but the essentials are very difficultly now challengeable. Like in, in, in the, the spread of crossbow is something way less surprising than we should think it like, and yet also much more important because it can show us in this sense the evolution of, of a much greater system than just you know the, the development of a weapon, right?
and all right I don't think we have to to add particularly more uh, we will definitely talk a lot about crossbow warfare in the future and for now I just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming contents and for now I thank you heartily for listening to me I wish you a nice time and see you next time bye